In any given city, you'll see protesters, activists, and preachers. But for all the passion and activism these individuals seem to conjure up, are all their efforts legitimate? Joining us now on that, in Princeton, New Jersey, via Skype, Chris Hedges, a columnist with Truth Dig. And in Victoria, British Columbia, Terry Glavin, columnist at the Ottawa Citizen. And we're glad to have both of you guys on the show again tonight. Uh, we just had a conversation about some of the land use uh, planning ideas around Young and Dundas Square, our big square in downtown Toronto that's got 56 million people streaming through it every year. And we finished off that conversation talking about Young Dundas as a place for protest. And that brings us to you. And Chris, why don't you start us off on this? How important do you think it is to a city's sense of itself, its vitality, call it what you will, to have that place where all the protesters gather and get their message out? Well, you know, Naomi Klein has written about this, the, the privatization of all space. And this is something that ironically played to the benefit of the Occupy movement in New York because Zuccotti was a private space. It was a private park uh, that had been built by the developers in the area uh, in exchange for uh, putting up these high rises on city land. Uh, and therefore, the normal city park rules didn't apply. Eventually, of course, what happened is uh, in concert with the uh, city uh, and the private corporation, uh, both police and private security guards essentially pushed uh, the occupiers in Zuccotti out. Uh, and then when you went back, they had these thuggy uh, corporate security uh, people who wouldn't even let us, you know, sit down on benches kind of thing. Um, uh, but I think that's a huge problem, that the destruction of the public square has made it extremely difficult for uh, opposition movements to find a center. Uh, and not only that, in the case of the Occupy encampments, find a place where they can carry out the logistics to sustain uh, prolonged uh, forms of resistance. So uh, that denial of public space has been a very effective weapon in the hands of the corporate state in blunting any kind of dissent. So, Terry, would you agree that you need some place that's publicly held, as Young Dundas is, in order to facilitate this kind of uh, freedom of expression? Well, well, of course. Well, of course. And I, 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 don't, uh, I don't equate that need and that right and that custom, uh, which uh, is actually quite um, lively in Canada and is certainly not diminishing at all. I don't, equ I don't equate that custom and practice with what Christopher has referred to as the sort of sustained uh, um, campaigns of resistance in the public square. That, that is actually what we saw in the case of the Occupy movement and why it collapsed. One of the reasons why I think it collapsed into, you know, collapsed in on its own uh, contradictions and absurdities is that people are, are, are throughout North America, and it certainly wasn't necessarily the corporate class at all, just got a little bit tired of dead junkies and vandalism and uh, uh, offenses to public hygiene. Sim simple as that. But the notion that, that uh, because the Occupy movement started in what was essentially privately owned space, did that hamstring it in some respect in a way that doesn't happen at Young Dundas Square in downtown Toronto? Well, those people who championed Occupy can hang their hats on any excuse they might like to explain its catastrophic failure and cataclysmic decline. Um, I don't know if that would be one of them. Chris, you want to follow up on that? Well, that's a ridiculous attack against the Occupy movement. Uh, the Occupy movement was physically destroyed. The encampments were eradicated in a central effort out of Washington, uh, you know, the idea that it fell in on itself uh, uh, is just not true. Uh, the, uh, you know, the encampment suffered in New York, where I spent a lot of time, certainly problems, uh, not least of which was the decision by the New York City police to drop homeless people off uh, at the park. Uh, once the individual tents went up, when it was cold, uh, it couldn't be policed, and that's when drugs came in and we had sexual assault. So there was a kind of breakdown, uh, but to characterize the number of the occupying 
as junkies. I mean, this is just slander. Okay. And as somebody who spent the time there, it's just not true. Terry, let me follow up with this then. Uh, Toronto had its own version of Occupy, as did many other cities, obviously, around the world. Uh, we also, I guess more latterly, had the Idle No More movement, which uh, wanted yeah. to bring Aboriginal issues to the fore and seemed to do a pretty good job of that. Is it important, in your view, in terms of protest, in terms of freedom of speech, to have these designated protest areas where people can come and share their beefs? I think it's, well, I mean, different cities have handled it different ways down through time across Canada. I think, I, I don't think there's any harm in it. I, I should rather that as much open space as possible be available to as much, uh, uh, as, as many forms of expression and protest as is possible. But there has been a tendency, you know, Vancouver, ha you know, Victoria's got Centennial Square, Vancouver's got uh, the, the old courthouse steps, the art gallery, um, and so on and so forth. The, um, the, there is, my, my, what, I, what I think is interesting is that there has been over the last quarter of a century the emergence of a kind of a, a protest culture or an activist culture, activist politics, which uh, it sort of um, evolves and unfolds in its own little universe, almost, almost completely separate from ordinary politics. And um, through the anti-globalization protests to its later iteration as the so-called anti-war movement to its iteration as the Occupy movement to its iteration as Idle No More, um, you know, this is about a quarter of a century of this sort of thing. The G20 protests in Toronto were, I think, a classic example of what I mean, um, in which absolutely nothing is actually accomplished at the end of the day. That there's nothing that the protest culture, that activist culture can identify to, for itself uh, as, a, as a victory of any sort. And even the, and I would say especially this, 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 this myth about consciousness raising, which as often as not betrays nothing but an absolute contempt for ordinary work, working people as though their consciousness is low and they have to be, they have to be elevated uh, to, the, to, the sta to the state of the cognoscenti. And Idle No More is actually a classic case of that. Uh, at the height of the Idle No More protests, uh, round dances, uh, shopping mall events, and so on, uh, an Ipsos Reid poll showed that um, roughly two-thirds of Canadians uh, were quite acutely concerned about Aboriginal issues in Canada. And in fact, that's exactly what the level was two years earlier. Um, and that, in fact, there was a tremendous amount of um, suspicion and skepticism about the Idle No More movement among Canadians generally. And in fact, it was slightly higher among Aboriginal Canadians. So I think a lot of this is really smoke and mirrors, because all it really takes to, ins to, you know, for, to insinuate oneself into a public conversation, a national debate about uh, an issue of concern, all you have to do is staple a slogan onto a stick and get a couple of your friends to march around in a circle somewhere, and you'll be on the, um, the evening news. Well, let me pick up on that for it Chris goes, Hedges. I, I just see it goes nowhere. Let me pick up on that for Chris Hedges, because in fact, Chris, I don't know if you've been to Young Dundas Square, but the fact is, in this roughly one acre space, you can have any number of different protest groups all protesting different things at the same time. And I wonder whether or not, just sort of logistically speaking, uh, that defeats the purpose of what everybody's trying to get out of this experience. Well, there's a conscious effort on the part of the corporate state to deny public space for any kind of protest. Uh, and the, 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 the example of that, of course, was the destruction of the Occupy movement. Uh, you know, the, the, the denial of uh, space by which the Occupy movement could continue to carry out its uh, form of dissent. Uh, that's something that we have seen, uh, you know, over the last few years. And uh, all of the correctives to democracy, at least in my country, have come through movements, which never achieved formal positions of power, uh, but took to the streets and organized, whether that's the abolitionists, uh, the labor movement, the suffragists who fought for women's rights, or the civil rights movement. And uh, the denial of public space to carry out Nonviolent, legitimate, legitimate, uh, democratic dissent is part of the 
kind of corporate coup d'etat, to court, quote John Ralston Saul, that's taken place, essentially shutting off the capacity by which we have the ability uh, to influence our own society and bring about reform. No, I hear what you're saying, though, but this is a different issue, I think, that I'm raising, which is we clearly have a public space in the middle of the biggest city in the country, now the fourth biggest city in North America. It is a public space. Anybody can go and protest, and in fact, many often do all at the same time. And I wonder if it's difficult to get the message out when six groups all at the same time in a relatively enclosed space are all fighting for the same little piece of the public's attention span. Well, you're, you're throwing out a hypothetical situation about a park that I know very little about. Um, you know, we had all sorts of groups uh, that had coalesced uh, around Occupy that had different agendas, including unions, uh, electrical unions, teachers unions, uh, that had specific agendas but came together uh, in that movement. Uh, I think one of the things that we also have to recognize is that the corporate state has quite effectively created corrals, uh, places removed from centers of activity, completely surrounded by uh, security and surveillance apparatus uh, that make or, in, in essence, contain uh, any kind of uh, street protest or dissent, essentially sort of uh, uh, rendering it uh, impotent. So, um, uh, you know, are there six different groups? I don't know. Have you been in the park on any particular day when that's the case? I mean, uh, I think you'd have to throw out a specific example, but I, I, I don't, you know, I don't, uh, it's not, it's not familiar territory for me. No, I understand. Okay, so fair enough. Uh, Terry, let me try it with you, though. There, there clearly, yeah. there aren't six different protests of 10,000 people each all in the park at the same time. That's a fair comment. But there are any number of different people with different messages in smaller groups all at the same time trying to get attention at Young Dundas Square. And I'm wondering if, in your view, uh, the logistics of that make any one of those protests more illegitimate in the eyes of the rest of the public? I don't know. In fact, I worry about this term legitimacy. I get where you're going with this, and I think it's slightly separate. You see, this notion of protest, movements, rallies, demonstrations, I think we have to be very careful about the language that we use. Uh, we used to rally. We used to have rallies. In fact, I'm not against this at all. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Only two weeks ago, I was, I was, a, I was a, a, a making a very spirited speech <laughs> at a rally uh, about the chi China's occupation of Tibet. Uh, so I'm in favor of this sort of thing. But that was, those kinds of things, that, 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 the purpose of that is actually to rally the troops, if you like, to rally one's spirits, to keep a spring in our step over a particular issue. A demonstration is, is precisely that. It's to demonstrate uh, a degree of public concern or alarm uh, or, or purpose uh, about a particular political agenda or what have you. I think the sort of thing that you see at Dundas and in Young Street and, and in various places across the country, the sort of Hyde Park that's what you're getting at, yeah? Mm -hmm. The Hyde Park space? Sure. It's a slightly different thing, and personally, I think it's a great idea to have that kind of a controlled and contained space. <laughs> um, my, my own grandfather, who was some sort of Fabian, Irish emigrant to Britain, uh, was, uh, used to bring his little box down to Speaker's Corner at, 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 uh, at, at Hyde Park. And, um, and, and make his, his, his speeches there. It's a way that it's a sort of a convention of, of ordinary working people, actually, to, to debate and share ideas and to shout at one another and, and, and uh, learn from one another. And uh, I, I think it's actually very, very healthy. Okay, Chris, and should let, me, be encouraged. let me try this with you, Chris, because no doubt in your years as a writer and journalist, reporter, so on, you have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of demonstrations. And I want to just echo something that was said in our last discussion here earlier in the program about uh, a, gr a large group of Tamils who started on one of the major thoroughfares of the city, went south down to the waterfront and took over essentially the elevated highway that goes along the waterfront in Toronto. We call it the Gardner Expressway. They stopped traffic in rush hour. It was an enormous, I mean, it was very organic. I'm not sure it was planned. Uh, so the question becomes, how big a deal in terms of a successful protest is the element of surprise, because that clearly was. Well, we, you know, let, let me go back to the Occupy movement. We never had the element of surprise because we were so heavily infiltrated. They always knew where we were going and what we were doing, nor did we attempt 
to uh, surprise the authorities. Uh, all decisions were made in public, uh, in general assemblies. All the cops had to do, they could have shown up in uniform and listened. Uh, so I don't think the element of surprise is um, an, a prerequisite for successful demonstrations. I mean, when they shut down Zuccotti, we uh, held uh, an opposition protest in Foley Square, in which 35,000 people showed up. Uh, and there were probably thousands of cops who showed up, too. Um, I, I don't think the element of surprise, I think what's more important is that you, you managed to pull significant numbers into the street. Hmm. Well, let me follow up with this, if I can. Ba uh, back in the day, if I can take you back to the, to the 1960s, it seemed to me that the protests were much more black and white. Get out of the Vietnam War, stay in the Vietnam War, that kind of thing. Today, it seems that a lot of the protest messages are much more subtle. And I, I hope you agree that the, you know, Occupy didn't have a single, simple message necessarily. It was much more complicated and layered. And I wonder whether the, uh, the lack of simplicity in the messages of a lot of the protests today harms the protesters' ability to make progress on the issues they care about. Chris, you first on that. The, the Occupy message was very simple and that is that we want to wrest power back from the hands of corporations and return it to the hands of citizens because everything emanates from corporate control whether it's over health care whether it's over our systems of information whether it's the legalized bribery uh, that comes from super PACs and citizens united everything emanates from corporate power uh... it was a message that the establishment had a difficult time hearing uh... but i think it was it did have a kind of simplicity. I think I would also argue that in the 60s, there were a variety of movements, uh, many of which, and I was a kid, but my father was involved in both the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement, which was antagonist, which were ant antagonistic even within the civil rights movement. By the end, uh, in 1968, uh, King was a very lonely figure, attacked uh, not only by the black power movement, Boot and Watts. Uh, I don't think movements... Uh, uh, you know, are ever simple. I think that uh, there are always fissures and tensions and factions. Uh, remember the whole sort of conflict between Malcolm and King itself, um, Nation of Islam and King and Malcolm. Uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think the 60s was a simple time. Uh, there were all sorts of uh, groups uh, that, that uh, certainly coalesced in opposition to the war, but were often deeply uh, antagonistic. So, uh, and that's the history of movements. Movements are messy, uh, nonlinear. Uh, they, you know, they rise and fall. Uh, Rosa Parks uh, sits on the bus in 1954. There's a kind of hiatus. Nothing really happens until the Freedom Rides of 1961. Uh, and I think we have to look at what's happening now. This uh, rejection of uh, globalism and uh, corporate dominance. Uh, of the industrialized world and increasingly the developing world, this creation of a neo-feudalism as creating a movement that uh, certainly has problems, uh, certainly is struggling, but I don't think is going away. Okay. Terry, you're under no obligation to accept my flawed thesis either, but would you care to weigh in on it? No, I don't. I, well, you know, it, what the heck? It might be a little flawed, but I actually think you're onto something. And, and uh, I think, I, I don't know if if one can be at this point very much more sophisticated than flawed. Something definitely has happened since the 1960s, there's no question. I think one way of looking at it is this. I think you can trace a, a, a trajectory of uh, the left um, within capitalist uh, industrial societies from indeed the late 1700s uh, without question, uh, in, at least until the, until the 1960s, I think in the United States. And, and I think one of the things that, it that will characterize it is a, a hope in the masses of the people and that it is from the masses of the people, from the industrial proletariat, that, that change will come. And uh, with the emergence of the counterculture in the 60s, which was largely suspicious of the masses, and indeed was, in, was, was in, in large measure in the United States hostile to the working class, there has been a kind of a fuzzy, um, uh, uh, inarticulate, inchoate, um, uh, uh, avant-garde kind of politics that has made, that has made uh, this, this claim of lineage uh, that you will often hear from uh, the Occupy movement and so on, just doesn't hold up. 
um, and the, you know, for the, the, there was, we can refer to the suffragists and the labor, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, and we know that there, was, there were identifiable objectives and goals there. Universal suffer, suffrage, the minimum wage, free speech, the right to freedom of assembly, the right to organize unions, um, the end of the, the color bar in the United States, the enforcement of the US Civil Rights Act. Um, there hasn't been, uh, and, and, and the, the sad thing about Idle No More in Canada, for instance, is that there hasn't been anything even vaguely resembling an agenda with a, a legislative program at all. Um, okay, let me jump and, in and, here and if I can. It's kind of a brand, let and me, it's, it's just it's dying exactly like Occupy died. Let me jump in here because we're literally down to our last minute, so I want to get 30 seconds from each one of you on what, in your view, was the best, most effective protest you ever saw during your years in journalism. Chris? Well, I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe, so... I watched them bring down the Stasi state in East Germany, the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia, Ceausescu in Romania. They were nonviolent, successful revolutions. That's pretty impressive. Terry? Um, there were a lot of things I saw in Afghanistan that impressed me. Um, I covered a lot of, uh, well, in the case of Idol No More, I covered a lot of the Indian rights movement in the 80s in, in Canada, logging roads blockades, fishing rights blockades, and so on. And those were re that was a real movement. And it, ac it accomplished real uh, change. Um, and unfortunately, I just don't see that at the moment. Gotcha. I don't know more. I want to thank both of you for coming on TVO tonight and sharing your views with us. Chris Hedges and Terry Glavin from Princeton, New Jersey, and Victoria, B.C., respectively. Thanks so much, guys. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.